Dakota uh, on my mind. <laughs> Senator thank, Kramer, thank you. Thank you, Chairman Carper, uh, again, and uh, thank you, witnesses. I, I want to add one point to the to the Denbury example that John Haru talked about in response to Senator Capito's question, especially since my friend from Wyoming is sitting right next to me. Um, that 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 example actually generates now net negative carbon oil in North Dakota as a result of injecting it into you know to old wells. Uh, a very important point, I think, that, that we've, we haven't brought up yet. Uh, there's so many things I want to get to, but Mr. Haru, I want to ask you, uh, Senator Whitehouse talked about a value proposition, which we know he's, he's talking about some sort of a profit opportunity in, in all of this. But with regard to the tax credit system, there are different values. Not every credit's created equally. Not every carbon-reducing technology is created equally. Have you ever done an analysis on the benefit of, say, a 45Q um, credit versus a credit for, say, electric vehicles, for example, uh, in terms of a dollar per ton or a ton per dollar um, comparison? Uh, Senator Kramer, yes. Uh, thank, thank you for the question. Um, um, I, actually, I was recently asked to uh, uh, give a comparative assessment of a, of a conceptualized $10,000 a ton EV credit in terms of what that would equate to on a ton of carbon basis. Um, um, what I, what I, uh, my valuation gave me a price of somewhere between $200 and $300 per ton of CO2 avoided over the life of that vehicle. Um, the average vehicle, if you can uh, consider that they're going to run somewhere in the neighborhood about 120,000 miles, that they uh, will have a fuel efficiency of about 23 miles per gallon, they will emit a total of a gasoline-fired vehicle will emit about 50 tons of CO2 over its entire lifetime. Uh, electric vehicles are not zero, so considering that they take their power from the grid, if you use just normalized grid uh, um, signatures, and the fact that there's a life cycle associated with production of battery and so on, they'll actually emit somewhere in the neighborhood of about 15 tons of CO2 over the life of that vehicle, uh, on a, again, on a normal life. So your, your net savings would be about 35 tons, and at $10,000, you're approaching $300 a ton there. So versus a 45Q, which is uh, $50 a ton today. for geologic storage, yeah. 35 for CO2 stored in conjunction with an So even if we went up to $80, it would still be a bargain. I think it would be a relative bargain. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I want to also follow up on something Senator Capito asked you about, and that is, of course, um, the, the uh, primacy that North Dakota has, not Wyoming has, that others are trying to get. Can you, can, since you work across the country and with the federal government, can you give us a little bit of a comparison as to why is, a, why is this primacy important to a state? What's the benefit versus, um, say, states that don't have it versus, say, the federal government's um, response to all of this? Sure. Well, I, I think the proof's in the, in the permits. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I believe the federal government has issued one Class 6 permit. The state of North Dakota has issued three with several pending. Um, and uh, we've only had that uh, primacy since uh, 2017. Um, so, so why is that, do you think? I mean, why is the state doing better than the federal government? Well, I think in, in the case of states, they're much more familiar with their local geology and the opportunities that the state affords. And, and regardless of, of the permitting authority, uh, in, you know, the, the federal oversight is really on the wells themselves. So the Class 6 program really does not deal with pore space access and some of the other ancillary things that are necessary for the construction and operation of a CCUS site. So our state actually passed comprehensive geologic storage rules prior to the uh, existence of the Class 6 program. Um, and and ultimately needed to go secure that primacy, uh, even though we previously had fully comprehensive rules, including poor space ownership, unitization provisions, uh, et cetera. How long does the permitting process take? So uh, in the state of North Dakota, the average uh, thus far for each of those permits has been seven months. Uh, the uh, my uh, recollection of the of the one federal permit it was on the order of five or six years in the state of Illinois. Can you, in the remaining seconds, can you explain um, how EOR actually function, functionally works, the amount of carbon stored compared to the downstream emissions from oil produced? Because that is part of the, you know, the you know, program that's the most controversial. 
Absolutely. Uh, so, so Denbury has done a fairly uh, extensive analysis of their own operations, um, and they estimate that roughly a quarter of their operations, especially those that are uh, industrially sourced or anthropogenic CO2, that each of those is, is a net carbon negative uh, oil production operation. So uh, our own research uh, at the Bell Creek field in southeastern Montana uh, further verifies that long-term uh, secure geologic storage. Uh, uh, our average uh, stored volumes over the course of a uh, project suggests that it's going to be on the order of a approximately one half ton of CO2 stored for each barrel of oil produced. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 